Hello, and welcome to our White House webinar on the annual report for the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Uh, we are thrilled that you are joining us today. Uh, you are joining us from all corners of our, of our great nation and the world. We always extend a special welcome to our international audience and remind everyone that a global pandemic requires a global response. We are partners with you as we fight against these pathogens together. Um, I am kicking, I'm Matt Hepburn and kicking off the session here. And I think it's always important that when we get into a conversation about pandemics and pandemic preparedness, we start with a bit of reflection on the horrible, horrible tragedy that we have all went through. And uh, for me personally, uh, I always feel like there are times when I don't really want to think about it anymore and I want to move on and I want to you know, get, get on with my daily life. And um, I don't think we can have this conversation without starting with acknowledging how horrible COVID-19 has been for all of us. Today, however, is focused on if we can, if there is a silver lining, it's focused on that silver lining because we are presenting you a progress report that demonstrates what I would call just extraordinary innovation and effort to make sure that pandemics never happen again. In this progress report that you'll hear about in this webinar, and you can, it's now publicly available so you can look it up, you'll see a strong section on the efforts of the United States government in close partnership across all of our society, across domestic and international, in terms of doing all of the things really comprehensively to ensure that pandemics never happen again. The second section is talks about our goals for next year. And what you're gonna hear about today is a blend of both of those. And it's going to be in a fireside chat format. We thought it would be most compelling to instead of just presenting a bunch of slides, to give you dialogue. And I am absolutely thrilled and excited about the people um, that you're going to hear from. These are true selfless servants in our government, and uh, they're going to tell you about what they've learned, what they know, and really give you a candid appraisal of where we need to go next. So let's get started. Um, and uh, I am super, super excited to introduce uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who's going to kick off our program today. Dr. Dr. Nelson is the acting director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. She's the first social scientist and woman of color to hold that role. Dr. Nelson leads six policy teams in their work to advance critical Biden-Harris administration priorities in science and technology. She is a deputy, a deputy assistant to the president and has also served since day one on the Biden-Harris administration as the deputy director of the newly created OSTP science and society team. On a personal note, I love working for Dr. Nelson and it's the simple reason that she leads by example. She truly, truly inspires me and she inspires all of our team with the values that she upholds. And I, I would argue her deepest value is this idea of equity, meaning that no one is left behind. And that I think is conveyed very clearly and consistently throughout our annual report. And it will be something that our office and frankly that our government will continue to push forward. Dr. Nelson. Thank you very much, Dr. Hepburn. You mentioned the uh, selfless servants uh, who are with us today to um, share uh, some updates from their work. Chief among these selfless servants, uh, it would be you at OSTP where you serve as uh, our senior advisor for, for pandemic preparedness. It is a great uh, joy, honor, and privilege to work with you every day. Uh, thank you for uh, your leadership in this space and thank you for the work that you and the team have done to organize this um, you know, update event that allows us to share with the American public what we've been up to in this space over the last year. So as Dr. Hepburn noted, I have the great distinct privilege of leading the Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, where we work together to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all of America. 
By its founding mandate, OSTP is focused squarely on the future. And indeed, we're probably the only component within the EOP, the Executive Office of the President, that has this kind of future focus mandate. In our work, we envision how science and technology can help shape a safe, equitable, flourishing world by tackling the tough challenges we face today, anticipating the unknown opportunities and obstacles that may lie ahead, and driving boldly toward both discovery and solutions. As we all know, and as Matt um, uh, so poignantly uh, said at the top, we're still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and its permutations. We also know there will be more pandemics and we need to be ready for them. In a letter he issued just before taking office, President Biden asked, I'm quoting him, what can we learn from the pandemic about what is possible or what ought to be possible to address the widest range of needs related to our public health, close quote. And on his first day in office, the president issued two key executive orders, one on advancing equity and one on strengthening the United States response to COVID-19 and leading, uh, being a leader in the world on global health and security. To answer President Biden's question and follow his directives, we're taking steps to ensure the United States is ready to respond effectively to future pandemics and to iterations of this pandemic. We have a responsibility to future generations to work with urgency now, to transform our capabilities, to contain outbreaks before they become epidemics or pandemics, and to take the threats of pandemics off the table completely. To do this, OSTP and our colleagues at the National Security Council and the White House COVID response team have been carrying out the work of our American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. This plan outlines a bold vision to directly address future threats and reduce associated inequities by transforming our medical defenses, ensuring situational awareness through early warning systems and real-time monitoring, strengthening public health systems, including domestic and international health infrastructure, building core capacities across supply, train to supply chains, and managing the mission by ensuring accountability and working collaboratively with the international science community. Since we released the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan one year ago, the US government has worked diligently to implement these goals, though more investments are needed. Today, in coordination with 16 other departments, agencies, and offices, OSTP is releasing the first annual report on progress towards implementation of the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. This annual report summarizes progress towards advancing the goals plans and recommends priority areas for investment and focus in the year ahead. As the report shows, the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan has sparked a renaissance in vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics uh, and in research and development to stop, treat, and detect pandemic threats. The plan has also strengthened early, war early warning of emergent threats. We now have the ability to detect viral threats anywhere in the world within days or weeks of their emergence. We have also seen new approaches for detecting threats using genome sequencing and wastewater sampling to aggregate and analyze pathogen data. We've gotten better at tracking pandemic threats by combining diagnostic, epidemiological, sequencing, and environmental data. Even with all, with all of these advances, transforming our capabilities will not be enough to eliminate the burden of pathogens, especially in vulnerable communities. Scientific and technological advances are now being paired with public engagement, trust building, and recognition of previous harms and challenges in public health. The report highlights key objectives for this coming year, including more efficiently developing and manufacturing broadly protective next generation vaccines, as well as spurring innovation and preventative technologies and in healthcare delivery, as well as accelerating the production of treatment so that everyone can get the care they need. This work at heart is about taking care of one another. It's about listening to our frontline workers and protecting ourselves, our loved ones, our friends and neighbors, and our fellow communities around the world. It's gonna take all of us working together to achieve this vision and we don't have a moment to waste.
we're really delighted that you can be with us this afternoon for this important conversation. And I turn things back over to Dr. Hepburn to get us started. Dr. Nelson, that was wonderful. <laughs> that was just uh, fantastic. Dr. Nelson, that was wonderful. That was just fantastic. That was amazing um, and, and greatly appreciate your comments. Um, I, I will say that at Office of Science and Technology, Office of Science and Technology Policy, we practice what we preach. Um, we emphasize transparency. And that's why you see a annual report that is public where, in which we welcome dialogue. We practice collaboration. We are not doing this alone. We have collaborated across all, bringing all the best of our federal government together, our state and local governments. Um, but our goal here is all of society, not a cliche. Our goal is to catalyze the best in all of us so that pandemics never happen again. And lastly, and you've already heard it a few times, but we're going to keep saying it again, is this, this idea of equity, that no one, no one is left behind. It's so important to us, and that's why we are leading with it. We are leading in this, and our first panelists uh, are going to be addressing equity. So we're going to get right to fireside chat number one. This is bringing innovation to the people. And I am super, I'm, I'm excited about all three panels. We're not going to say which one's best. We're not going to do that. Um, but what we will say is, is that we are kicking off with, with two amazing individuals. Uh, I, I call both of these women heroes of public health. And I don't, I don't use the term hero lightly. Um, let me introduce them. Uh, so first, Dr. Carolyn Green. So since January of uh, 2022, Dr. Carolyn Green has served as the Deputy Director of Science and Policy at the Office of the Surgeon General on detail from the CDC. Prior to joining the Office of the Surgeon General, Carolyn served as the Acting Deputy Director of the Influenza Preparedness and Response, and also as a Field Site Support Unit Lead within the Influenza Division in the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease at CDC. I will tell you that Carolyn has personally inspired me on how we build trust with communities. She's clearly devoted her career uh, for that purpose, and she uniquely demonstrates uh, as a professional colleague empathy and understanding, and I'm sure that's going to come out in the chat. Also, we have uh, Dr. Nahid Bedelia, who is the Senior Policy uh, Advisor for the Global COVID Response on the White House COVID-19 Response Team. She is an infectious diseases physician, the founding director of Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. And over the last decade, Dr. Bedelia has designed and served as the medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit over at Boston Medical Center. Um, we should also add that she is uh, truly an international response hero in terms of all the work that she's done on many Ebola outbreaks on the front lines taking care of patients. And if there is one thing about Dr. Bedelia, it is that she always puts the patient first. And I'm sure that's going to come across uh, when we hear from them. So, Carolyn, I'll turn it over to you. Uh Thank you so much uh, to uh, Dr. Hepburn and uh, Dr. Nelson and everyone at OSTP for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar on the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, I will say that I was fortunate enough uh, uh, this year to represent the Office of the Surgeon General in the Pandemic Innovation Task Force. And what was immediately apparent was the tremendous expertise and talent there is for innovation and countermeasures, diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, PPE. But what was also immediately apparent uh, is the need to in, invest and dedicate expertise, energy, and resources in bringing these innovations to the people, to all people with equity. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we formed an interagency working group. And the name of our working group is lengthy but descriptive. We are called the Building Trust and designing for health behavior uptake working group. 
We continue to meet informally today because we are committed to uh, promoting health behavior uptake in all communities with equity. We realize this is a tremendously difficult task. It requires a multi-pronged approach, but I do just want to review sort of five principles that I think we are trying to adhere to. One, uh, promoting health behavior uptake requires building trust in science, public health, uh, government, and health agencies. Two, in order to build trust, uh, we must um, engage with all levels of government, communities, societies. Uh, we must uh, sort of step away from a top-down approach and instead engage local leaders, representatives, spokespersons as we work. Three, it is critical to um, and when we are producing new medical products or public health interventions, it is critical to engage communities at the very beginning. In this way, we can ensure that we have human-centered design, usability, acceptability, and that we're able to reach all communities. Four, as we develop these partnerships across levels of governments, across communities, across societies, it's important to maintain these relationships in an evergreen fashion. We have to work together both between and during public health emergencies. And finally, five, we have the need to build the capability to address the root causes of misinformation, to communicate effectively across community, communities in our current health information environment, which is increasingly complex. So I just wanna end uh, the same way that uh, Dr. Hepburn just ended by saying, I am thrilled that we are beginning this webinar, this session today with bringing innovation to the people with equity, since this is such a critical piece in the success of pandemic preparedness and response. And I am particularly pleased to be having this conversation with Dr. Nahid Bedelia, uh, who brings such valuable insight and expertise to this topic. So Dr. Bedelia, thank you. Dr. Green, thank you so much for this remarks, and thank you, Dr. Hepburn and Dr. Nelson for starting us off on what's important, which is why we do this, why do any of this, um, which is that we've learned the lessons of and the costs of what happens when we don't prepare for the threats that are emerging with increasing speed. I also want to thank the OSTP for bringing us together for the AP3 annual assessment launch today. It's, it has been an honor to co-chair the Steering Committee for Pandemic Innovation with Dr. Matt Hepburn as we take a short range and a long range view on how do we build science and technology capacity to improve, improve our resilience against new emerging infectious diseases threats and to do that more equitably. And whether it be my current policy position or my work as a frontline clinician that Dr. Hepburn talked about or as a researcher, I think that idea that you need to start with equity at the beginning rather than as an afterthought, it is so critical. And I just wanna go through in my remarks, a couple of reasons why it has to be at the beginning. First, we act on what we can count. And when we talk about the importance of investing in data systems and surveillance systems domestically and globally, Picking up uh, those kinds of data streams allow us to understand not just the burden of disease, but to also be able to pick up the signal from the noise. When we talk about the idea, the impact that COVID-19 has had on the world, right? In May, the World Health uh, Organization released that about 15 million additional access deaths were caused during the COVID pandemic, both due to the disease itself, as well as lack of access to care uh, to address other ongoing medical conditions. We need to figure out what people are dying of, as well as what they're living with, to be able to address you know, these problems more equitably. Two, it's important to start with the equity at the beginning because diversity and who sets the research agenda at the very beginning determines how thoughtful and how integrated our, our operational systems are in understanding how uh, these problems affect all our communities. 
And so when we talk about research capacity and clinical trials capacity, the importance of doing that, not just here in all our communities, but globally in uh, low and middle income countries through work that NIH and others are doing already um, through, through the Ebola outbreak uh, uh, that we've uh, Dr. Pepper talked about with trials such as the, the PREVAIL trial or more recently uh, the work that was done in Democratic Republic of Congo, including local researchers um, and helping set that the research agenda in more equitable way is important. Three, what you said, Dr. Green, is so important. We can create innovations all we want, but to create innovations that are useful to all our communities, we need to include those communities in that research and trying to figure out what is, uh, what is needed and what is going to be acceptable, affordable, accessible, and that's sort of the critical principles of equity. And, and then lastly, the reason why we have outbreaks is because early detection matters. And at the terminal end of all infectious diseases, surveillance for infectious diseases are communities that don't have access to care. About half of the world lacks access to essential health services and diagnostics and treatment. So we can't figure out when there's a new threat when there are already gaps in equity at the very beginning. So intention matters. And it's not just that the equity, the principle of equity is important because it is so critical, but it's also critical to the operational success for pandemic preparedness. So I'll end that and with that and pass it on to you, Dr. Green. Thank you so much, Dr. Bedelia. You've already begun to answer my first question, but I'm gonna pose it anyway to give you a chance to, to even add to your, to your wonderful opening remarks. Uh, clearly, we, we all on this call and, and in this webinar agree that equity is central to U.S. actions on pandemic preparedness. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of continue to discuss why that is and perhaps even provide some uh, examples. Yeah, I, I'll start by saying infectious diseases make it so obvious how interconnected the world is. I mean, I, I think that when you talk about preparedness, pandemic preparedness is a global exercise that includes all of our communities because an outbreak anywhere is an outbreak everywhere. You know, and, and that connection, it's manifested in the way that we live our lives. You know, as, as the population increases, right, the population's doubled since I was born on the face of this earth. And we're closing that distance between boundaries between animal and human habitats. We're increasing the risk of spillover events of new pathogens that may exist in well-balanced, you know, uh, reservoirs that are now being introduced into the human population. Protecting vulnerable pop communities, particularly at those front lines, allows us to quickly pick up those threats and respond to those threats before outbreaks become epidemics and epidemics become pandemics. But we're also very much interconnected. And so the importance of equity and making sure that those outbreaks or those first cluster of cases are quickly identified is, is critical because look at the way we travel and live. In 2019, 1.46 billion people took a flight. Everything in the world is now one flight away. The way that we trade, the way we seek health care, Everything is connected. Our supply chains are connected. And hence, ensuring that there is uh, sustainability and resilience in, in, the, in, in, in the response at all our global communities is important for that reason. Second, here's my experience with all the outbreaks that I've been part of as a clinician at the front line, which is that outbreaks attack us at our known fault lines. If we don't protect vulnerable communities and overwhelmed healthcare systems affects all of us. If we don't protect essential frontline workers, it affects all of us. And those barriers to care that exist even before epidemics or outbreaks are actually just accentuated. So that importance of equity starts at the very beginning when we build a more equitable access to healthcare or public health resources, we are inherently building a more resilient system against new pandemic threats. Um, the other, other things that I'll talk about is that, you know, we've, we've, we've made some efforts over the last year, for example, to be able to sort of ensure that those gaps in access can be uh, built better. One uh, can be better bridged, but we need to continue to invest in them. One example is the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program, a partnership between CDC and 21 partners, uh, partner organizations uh, that are pharmacies that help make the COVID vaccines available to over 284 million Americans, including many communities of color and underserved populations, or the, 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 the U.S. Global Vaccine Access Pro Program, what we call Global, uh, global Vax, which is uh, established to increase that same kind of global COVID vaccine uptake in low and middle income countries. 
Wonderful, very, very comprehensive. I will, I will add two small um, examples of, of interest that are, are mentioned in the in the AP3 report, and these relate to again, as you've talked about, equity in um, promoting uh, behavior uptake across communities. Um, the CDC's vaccine task force uh, formed an insights unit that um, collects data from 24 sources to better understand uh, the concerns, frustrations, and questions related to vaccines um, across communities. And then they can use this with their partners to develop uh, communication strategies for communities most at need. Similarly, um, the uh, Veterans um, Health Administration uh, launched three rapid uh, response teams that collected uh, data in real time, qualitative and quantitative data uh, to better understand vaccine confidence and vaccine hesitancy in both veterans and employees. And once again, this allows Allowed them to then create communication strategies uh, for use by trusted healthcare providers and, and colleagues to promote vaccine uptake. So again, these are the themes that we're seeing uh, throughout. I'm, I'm going to switch a little bit here and broaden to a topic that I'm especially excited to hear about from you, Dr. Bedelia, given your extensive experience. Um, uh, clearly, um, equity is important in both domestic and global public health responses. So um, I'm curious to hear from you uh, if you could share some of the ideas uh, from the AP3 report related to global health equity. Thank you, Dr. Green. I'm gonna put them into three specific themes. First and foremost, uh, one of the things that uh, the neglected dimension of global health security report that was released after the West African Ebola epidemic said was that we exist in a cycle of panic and neglect. We tend to respond to outbreaks and when they disappear, we forget about them. And what the important part of the work that we're doing today and what you'll see reflected in the AP3 annual assessment is the importance of investment and intention, common goals that are set, and then money that is being put behind it to ensure financial stability to be able to attain those goals. And that includes strengthening international infrastructure for pandemic preparedness, uh, providing financing, improving capacity for production for medical countermeasures, and then ensuring equitable access to those resources during a public health response. And we do that, the United States does that along with other WHO states by working on strengthening pandemic preparedness through approaches such as the International Health Regulation Monitoring and Evaluation Framework and working to identify core capacities and continuing to build um, ways that we can collaborate more quickly during pandemic threats. In 2020, for example, the G7 leaders committed about uh, committed support for up to 2027 for at least 100 uh, low and middle income countries in, in implementing the very core capacities that are identified the international health regulations to, uh, to surveil, uh, identify and respond to new threats. The U.S. has also been working with 40 countries, in the 19, including the 19 Global Health Security Agenda countries, investing in over $2 billion in, in, since 2015 in helping with operational technical assistance in meeting those core capacities. And most recently, part of this intention is working on the idea of a 100-day mission in the appearance of, uh, with the appearance of new threats and ensuring that we have diagnostics, uh, vaccines and therapeutics ready to go. So that kind of financing to try to get preparedness ready is needed now. It's not something you commit to when there's a threat. And the way that the U.S. has done that is through support of organizations such as partnerships, such as the Coalitions for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. We gave a historic $150 million to stimulate and accelerate research on priority pathogens that are biological threats. And, and the last part is we've helped, you, the US government has helped support um, development implementation of the World Bank's financial intermediary fund for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. We've, uh, the State Department has contributed $450 million to this FIF, which will finance, help uh, critically finance or help finance critical investments to strengthen pandemic preparedness at all capacities at national, regional and international. Wonderful, thank you. Clearly a, a theme that's emerging here is the importance of partnerships, whether that's partnerships at the local community level or our global partnerships. Clearly we uh, these relationships are, are so critical to us uh, addressing equity moving forward. 
Um, so my, my final question is actually a look ahead. Um, I would love to hear, Dr. Bedelia, what you are most excited about uh, in terms of how innovation can improve equity in our future pandemic response efforts. Yeah, exactly for the reasons that we talked about. I think what I hope is that our long range vision, our priorities that we've set through this report are going to take us from being a culture of outbreak uh, response to one of uh, at least outbreak preparedness and ideally one of outbreak prevention. And I think that we do that by, uh, uh, by doing a few different things. One, we need to integrate pandemic prevention into understanding and taking care of the endemic burden of disease. And the, for example, diagnostics are a good example of this. One of the things that the AP3 report talks about is this idea of building diagnostic capacity for the world through multiplex platforms that help identify not just endemic infectious diseases, but also high priority pathogens that have the capacity to potentially cause an epidemic in the future. In 2021, the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics uh, mentions that about 47% of the world doesn't have access to essential diagnostic services. If we don't know what people are getting sick with, how can we figure out if a new disease has spilled over from animals into humans? And to do that, we need to, these multiplex diagnostics are exciting because they build on the work of, uh, for example, the Global Access Program that was built in 2019 that helps uh, helps identify endemic uh, disease, infectious diseases such as HIV and tuberculosis and elsewhere. But this would integrate now ability to quickly get uh, easy to use diagnostics and a lot of laboratories around the world that also pick up the signal from the noise with new uh, priority pathogens. The work that's being also done to increase broad-based antivirals and vaccines are critical because we need these antivirals for both endemic as well as, already, as, well as priority pathogen diseases, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever or um, you know Lassa fever, which affect many parts of the world that are on the priority pathogen that already carry a population burden. Getting um, antivirals that are broad-based through work through NIH's and BARDA's antiviral program for pandemic Pandemics is going to help alleviate some of that um, uh, burden because it'll help identify patients early to bring them to care, which of course increases chances of, of survival. The, the other reason I think we need to link um, pandemic preparedness to endemic burden of disease is because we need to create a healthy bioeconomy. We need to have a demand for endemic burden diseases, diagnostics, as well as treatments, and link that to pandemic preparedness so we can have sustainability. Now, the U.S. has done a lot of work through COVAX um, to help you know, with the capacity strengthening, and we've done a lot of work uh, through USAID, um, as well as the U.S. International Development Finance Corp to help regional vaccine and manufacturing capacity, but this would go further by uh, by attaching endemic infectious diseases support with the, with the pandemic uh, surveillance that we're looking for. Two, we need to invest in supply chain diversification and sustainability because when there is a crunch, those who get left behind are those who have the fewest resources. And ensuring that we have sustainable supply chains helps, including essential uh, mapping out essential medical product manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries helps us build that sustainability and reach our goals of equity. And then the last is we need to integrate research into our response. And that means integrating uh, clinical practice and clinical research during an emergency, but also ensuring that we have supporting technologies such as innovative ways to reach the home and remote locations of care, um, telehealth, physiological monitoring, home diagnostics, all of these things both help the future state of pandemic prevention, but also improve equity. And then very last thing that I'll add is we need to look beyond the present moment. Look at the impact of long COVID or what we discovered after the West African Ebola epidemic, the post Ebola virus disease syndrome. We need to look beyond the acute setting and have healthcare systems and research systems that help us understand the total burden of disease after a pandemic. Thank you so much, Dr. Bedelia. Your, your uh, vision is, is inspiring and certainly excites me and I'm sure all of us also. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I think I will turn it back to uh, uh, Dr. Hepburn, but thank you again, Dr. Bedelia. Thank you, Dr. Green. Wow, <laughs> unbelievable. What a great start. I, you know, again, I, I wish, uh, 
uh, I know everybody's busy. You got to go back to fighting the pandemic after the webinar. But I mean, to uh, just a truly, truly outstanding discussion and, and uh, appreciate again, both of you for your service, for your dedication, and thank you for sharing your wisdom uh, with all of us today. So we're going to move on to the second panel. This is Innovation in Biotechnology for Pandemic Preparedness. And uh, this panel, we intended to, to be a bit of the, the fun part, the exciting, the, the gee whiz, the, uh, you know, what, what is the, the future promise that, you know, that we all feel that, that hope for the future because of the technology and the progress that we can make. So what we did for this panel, um, uh, we, we didn't want a bunch of people just briefing the program and saying, here's what we're doing. I, I, I really, really wanted people uh, who uh, get things done. So what I like about our two panelists, and I'll introduce them in just a second, is, is that they are both action. They are both implementation. They have this track record of being successful in moving our government to sparking uh, breakthrough innovation. So really excited about what they're going to say. So uh, we'll start with Dr. Rachel Florence. Dr. Florence is currently a senior advisor to Dr. Francis Collins, the president's acting science advisor here at the White House, where she works on several scientific initiatives for the administration, including a national hepatitis C elimination program. Uh, certainly something we're all very, very inspired and excited about. Dr. Florence also serves as a senior advisor at the immediate office for the director of the National Institute of Health and as a special advisor for the NIH director on COVID-19 diagnostics. I will also flag that Dr. Florence uh, was really the driving force behind a program called Say Yes to COVID Test. Um, if you're saying, well, that's curious, I wonder what that is. Go to the AP3 <laughs> annual progress report, you'll see a box that really highlights the breakthrough innovation and also the resilience to drive this concept that we now all accept as normal, which is that home testing can be so useful in pandemic response. Our second panelist is Dr. Sandeep Patel, who is the current director in the Division of Research, Innovation and Ventures, much easier known as DRIVE. Gotta love the name, <laughs> you know, in terms of progress. Uh, it speaks well for, for Sandeep. Um, at DRIVE, he oversees a diverse portfolio of investments, partnerships, and novel financing strategies aimed at advancing potentially transformative technologies and capabilities to improve our ability to prevent, prepare for, and respond to health emergencies, uh, such as pandemics. In particular, again, going back to our AP3 annual progress report, there's a box that features BARDA Ventures. Sandeep is the driving force, again, um, behind this new way of how we think that we can catalyze the best of private sector investment for solving our pandemic preparedness challenges. Dr. Florence, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, for the kind introductions and for the invitation. Um, I want to congratulate again our colleagues at the Office of Science and Technology Policy for the release today of the first annual report detailing the progress towards the implementation of the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, the report, if you've had a chance to look at it, is an impressive uh, document that describes in detail the activities and progress that took place across multiple government agencies during the COVID-19 response. It's a reminder of the achievements in vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics in particular, as well as other critical areas. Um, Sandeep, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to address you as Sandeep since we know each other. Sandeep is the director of um, BARDA Drive and the director of the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures at BARDA. You are uniquely positioned to be thinking about the learnings from COVID-19, um, particularly as they relate to biotechnology innovation, which is the topic of our panel. So you've been thinking about how all this might be used for what we call future pandemic preparedness and um, future proofing pandemic preparedness and different path pathogens. So let's let's talk about this a little bit first. We hear about the next pathogen. We hear that it might look very different from SARS-CoV-2 in terms of modes of transmission, incubation period, symptoms, severity of disease, post-disease syndromes. So how do you think about future proofing of pandemic preparedness? 
Uh, thanks, Rachel. First of all, pleasure to be here with you. Really excited for this conversation. 20 minutes is going to be uh, way too short for this. Uh, and, and thanks to the OSTP colleagues for, for hosting this and, and the release of the, the report. Um, so to your question, I think this is a really important question, Rachel. Um, it's one that keeps me up at night uh, along with my children. Um, and so, you know, what we should do, I think, is to take stock both of the good and the bad of the COVID-19 response. Um, you know, really meet the moment in terms of charting kind of the path forward, uh, preparing against future threats and things like that. Um, I think the pandemic plan lays this out clearly pretty well. Um, what we shouldn't do is, is over-index to a potential SARS-CoV-3. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, there's a lot of viral families out there, pandemic potential, they all have their unique signatures. Um, and we don't know when outbreaks will occur, where they'll occur, how variants will surprise us. Uh, and with climate change and, and human development um, and global development, this is going to create new opportunities for, for human wildlife interactions, zoonosis events, the emergence of new viral families, uh, and even things like fungal pathogens and other, other kind of threats. And so uh, the, it, it's, it becomes very difficult to, to then prepare for both these sort of known and, and unknown threats. And so one way I think of thinking about this in terms of future proofing um, is to consider that uh, focusing on pathogen itself, I think, is only one line of defense. Um, we know, for example, that there are clinical consequences for, um, for uh, infections across multiple types of infections, uh, both acutely and, and post-acutely, chronically, and we're seeing this with long COVID. Um, sepsis is one example here. Um, you know, you wouldn't think, uh, by the way, that radiation exposure has anything to do with pandemic preparedness. Uh, but people who experience radiation exposure can suffer dysregulation of their immune system, which, which is sepsis, uh, in a similar way that people might experience dysregulation of immune systems due to, due to SARS-CoV-2 infections or other, other, other pathogenic infections. Um, so many of my colleagues at BARDA over the years have, have you know, really pioneered this approach of thinking about this problem from the disease perspective, right? And starting to think about, well, if we had treatments for sepsis, if we had treatments for things like acute respiratory distress syndrome, right, the damage to the lungs from things like SARS-CoV-2, um, we would be in a position where we would have treatments for multiple types of outbreaks and we would be better prepared and be able to hedge against some of these unknown threats. Um, it also has the advantage of actually shortening the list of what we need to develop. And so I think this is a really key approach to, to future proofing. Um, we started a program a few years ago called Solving Sepsis to, to really drive at this. There's been a lot of progress in terms of these amazing diagnostics that can help predict, you know, whether you might experience sepsis in the future in multiple care settings. And I think these are going to be incredibly powerful tools against pandemic preparedness as they get adopted and, and scaled. Um, the second point here is I think we need to start thinking about uh, pandemic preparedness um, not as a separate problem from health and wellness generally. This point was made earlier, but I just want to emphasize this because you know having a functional health and wellness system, uh, which includes closing health equity access gaps, is, is probably one of our most uh, effective defenses against pandemics. Um, what makes me optimistic is that there's a revolution happening in our healthcare system right now. Right, there's advances in science technology that are driving new digital health tools, social behavioral uh, insights, uh, synthetic biology, advanced manufacturing, new types of distribution channels, uh, new ways of doing clinical trials. These are incredibly powerful uh, forces for good, not only in our healthcare system to, to develop and make accessible you know, new life-saving medicines, but to, to use this system then for pandemic preparedness. Um, the, the last point I wanna make in terms of future proofing too is, is while, you know, we know we need to develop a, a set of products and have a certain capability to, to be prepared and really try to get to that preventative state. We also know that um, there's going to be unexpected scenarios. Um, there's going to be elements of, a, of, a, of an outbreak that we don't know. And, and one of the most effective tools that we have is just our system of partnering uh, across government, across industry, and, and, and across the um, different partners there. Um, and, you know, at BARDA, I think we're, we're, we're really proud of the fact that we've, you know, the, the partners we've had in industry helped uh, drive a lot of the development of the mRNA vaccines and things like that when it was needed in a, in a rapid way. And I think we need to continue to kind of re-envision this model, thinking about new ways to partner uh, across government with industry and different partners. And um, we have, you know, we actually have a, a, a solicitation, out. I know uh, Dr. Hepburn mentioned uh, uh, that we're not advocating for our programs, but I wanted to mention we're actually... Uh, 
we have a, 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 a notice out to, to get input from the community on, on these types of partnering models and wanted to, to flag that. Um, the last thing I'll just say on this real quick is, you know, future proofing is going to be hard, right? Um, uh, it's going to take enormous resources. We've, we've had some great progress, but given the immense um, losses, the suffering that we've seen during COVID-19, over 1 million American lives lost, 4.5 million globally, um, and all of the other consequences, you know, I think this is something that we just have to do. Um, thank you, Sanjeev. Um, hard, hard to pivot, but we're going to pivot into onto another topic that's close to both our hearts. It's the topic of diagnostics. Uh, so we both worked pretty intensely on the diagnostic space uh, during the COVID-19 response. And I think you just pointed out remarkable changes have taken place in this space in the past three years. Um, when we think that now the American public is now testing for an infectious disease at home, maybe several times a week with uh, tests that are purchased over the counters in your local pharmacies um, at, and at scale. I mean, this is really a revolution. So, um, you were immersed in this. What, what innovations have you seen in the diagnostic space that you think are worth noting here? Um, and how will they support our future pandemic preparedness initiatives? Yeah, no, thanks, Rachel. This is this is definitely an exciting space. Uh, I mean, it's remarkable, as you pointed out, to see this sudden shift in, in acceptance and normalization of home testing. Um, you know, thanks to efforts from my colleagues at BARDA uh, and you and your colleagues at RADx. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, we, we invested in these in, in in home molecular tests. You know, starting several years ago, and you know, at the time there, there was a lot of pushback and, and a lot of challenges in terms of uh, acceptance by by public clinicians, regulators, others. And I think we've you know found ways to push through this and really accelerate timelines. You know, across all of our efforts, and it's just it's very very exciting. Um, I think going forward, what's what's even more exciting here is that now that we have this sort of infrastructure in place, right? We have uh, this acceptance, this, this, this initial acceptance of home testing as a paradigm, um, the, the technology that's increasingly um, uh, miniaturized, lower cost, more accessible, um, this creates this opportunity. And I think the key question going forward is, is how will this diagnostic revolution really play out over time? How should it play out over time? Um, and, and to me, the, the, the things that I'm seeing that's exciting, there's, there's really sort of two things that I think are going to emerge that we need to move towards. So one is, you know, the current tests are, are still, um, I would say, only give us a fraction of the insights uh, and the information we need to make day-to-day -day decisions, uh, to manage risk, to manage our lives in this sort of complex setting, right? Um, and the, the second piece is that, you know, these tests are still reactive by nature. In other words, we need to know what we're looking for before we can design and deploy and make available these tests. And I think there's opportunities to kind of shift on both. On the, the first point, um, you know, I think the, the opportunity is that we go beyond diagnostics that tell us answers to questions like, are we infected or not? And I think the, the opportunity is, you know, we have, we, there's been studies, we've, we've supported some work um, uh, suggesting that, you know, uh, wearables and other commonly available dice, devices, you know, might be able to pick up early signs of infection, even pre-symptomatically. Um, there are uh, uh, approaches now where, uh, we, we're able to potentially differentiate between those who might experience severe versions of the disease and those who might experience mild, predicting sepsis and things like that. Um, we have the ability potentially with these diagnostics to, to um, uh, differentiate acute versus chronic symptomology of a disease, so long COVID versus you know, acute infection, to detect uh, whether you're uh, infectious or not. And I think antigen tests have, have shown to be a promising approach there, right? And so I think there's a wealth of opportunities to, to get at these questions that people need to answer on a day-to-day -day basis and develop the diagnostics for that. And again, miniaturization, low cost of sensors, um, and increasingly sophisticated understanding of our immune systems. I think these are all driving this disability. And you know, I think going forward, what we'll have to think about is how do we how do we sustain this this kind of diagnostics revolution? Yeah. Uh, um, sorry. Okay. I, Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think on on that point, um, we've talked a little bit, and we'll talk further about um, public public-private partnerships in the space and how um, important they were during the COVID, COVID response. Um, the RADx program was one such program. Um, they're now responsible for 3.8 billion tests that have been used in the, in the US uh, since their inception in April 2020. Um, 
So just to, to finish on our uh, diagnostics topic, Sandeep, I wanted to ask you sort of a more practical question. Um, so as Matt said, I'm now working on a hepatitis C elimination program. Our diagnostics uh, situation is not good. We have a two-step process. The diagnostics are not where we need them to be. From what you've learned over COVID, how, how might you see all of that helping our uh, a sort of a concrete example today? The, sort of how, how would we... Uh, improve our hepatitis C diagnostics based on what you've seen in in the space. Yeah, I mean the the I think the quick answer to that now is that you know now that we have a pathway for for uh, clinical studies, we have uh, a lot of uh, underlying platform technologies that have been tested uh, and implemented in in real settings. This presents an enormous opportunity to plug and play essentially, right? To to just change out what we're what we're testing for, what we're looking for. We have the ability now to multiplex. Uh, multiple tests in one setting, and we're seeing this with respiratory panels. And I think, you know, Hep C is a, there's a great opportunity with Hep C and many other uh, pathogens to 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 really kind of integrate this into into the you know existing diagnosis platform in a way that was you know challenging before. Great, thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to another question for you. Um, there's this paradox in pandemic preparedness um, in that investing prior to a pandemic is generally not economically viable for the private sector. And yet the investment is uh, critical for the response to be successful. Um, we hear a lot of talk about warm base, uh, that, um, which means you know, keeping the manufacturing and production ready to go during a lull so that it can ramp up, ramp up during the pandemic. Um, but, but is that economically realistic? And so you've been thinking a lot about that. How should we be thinking about commercial sustainability and the private sector? And what's the role of our federal government there? Yeah, this is a, this is an important point. I think the, um, you know, the, we've seen the, the, the global GDP uh, drop by something like 3% between 2019, 2020, that that's roughly, you know, $2 trillion of value lost. I think, you know, and that's, you know, on top of all the the human toll uh, that we've experienced, so I think there's a clear argument that that it's not economically viable to not invest in pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. I think the the challenge, as you pointed out, is the incentives. Is is how do we align these incentives so it kind of makes sense? And I think, um, you know, one point I'll make here is that I think this is the the, the reason BARDA exists. Um, you know, I think what what uh, BARDA typically does is is in, invest with the private sector in developing a lot of these medical countermeasures uh, in the context of emergencies that may not be commercially viable, right? Where there's a, there's a role for the federal government to, to de-risk um, and share risk with the private sector. So I think that's important. I think some, in, in many cases there, there isn't that clear alignment. Um, but I think there, there's a lot uh, of opportunity that, that we haven't quite realized in terms of aligning this risk. And, and one, one example is we launched this program uh, last year called BARDA Ventures. Um, it's a public-private partnership with the nonprofit uh, Global Health Investment Corporation to, to solve for this very problem. Uh, and the goal of this partnership is to invest public dollars uh, the same way the venture capital community would. Um, uh, but instead of, and that is to give cash in exchange for partial ownership of the company uh, and, and to, to kind of co-invest in, in the company. Um, but instead of focusing on, on commercially viable uh, 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 technologies and companies purely, the spin here is that they're looking at uh, technologies that are going to have key roles in, in, um, in public health emergencies in the future, including pandemics. Um, you know, disease surveillance, new vaccine platforms, prophylactic therapies, healthcare capacity, uh, computational drug design, uh, clinical trial management, these are all examples where there, there is a commercial path uh, for these capabilities, and there's a clear line of sight for improving our ability to, to uh, respond to pandemics. And I think finding that kind of middle ground and making the investments, de-risking it, um, crowding in capital from the private sector to this is one uh, way that um, you know, this program is designed to kind of thread the needle of, of that commercialization question. Um, there's a lot of examples of this. I think you know, there's, there's explorations of mRNA is a great example where um, you know, there are clearly use cases for, for cancer immunotherapies and things like that, as well as, you know, uh, treating infection, uh, vaccinating against infectious diseases and uh, treating against infectious diseases. And so these platforms are incredibly important um, kind of dual use technologies. Um, Great. Yep. Oh, yeah. One last point I wanted to make on this in terms of warm basing, I think, you know, to me, at least, I, I think that's probably not the, the best way to kind of approach the issue. I think, 
it, it becomes difficult, as we've seen with COVID, to, to ramp up and down um, um, manufacturing capacity with these supply and demand shocks. And it's not just facilities and technologies, it's people and workforce and things like that. I think the, the key sort of opportunity is thinking about, well, what are the other use cases for a given technology uh, that might sustain it in between pandemics and things like that. Um, and you know, the, the work from, from ASPRA's industrial-based expansion efforts has, has really done this to invest in a lot of manufacturing capacity for that purpose. Um, and we talked about this with diagnostics. There's an opportunity to, to take diagnostics and really diversify the platform, so. Great, thank you. Okay, so my last um, my last question for you is about uh, novel manufacturing approaches. So, um, you know, we we've heard about the amazing mRNA vaccine story um, that, thanks to basic and advanced research investments, allowed the development, testing, authorization, and manufacturing of vaccines um, to millions of people. Really, at um, in in um, should, dare I say warp speed, <laughs> um, but that's what it was. Can you can you talk so about um, other innovations in manufacturing approaches that may be less well known but still critical for future pandemic preparedness? Yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunity here, and and again, this is an area where where there's a there's a there's a revolution happening in terms of um, the of biologics as as medicines and um, the manufacturing associated with them. I think the the couple points here that I that I think are, are worth making are that. Um, there, there's an enormous amount of manufacturing capacity being expanded for things like nucleic acid production, protein production, cell gene therapies, and things like that. Um, and those are going to be really important. I think in terms of a, a rapid response scenario, um, one thing that we need to, to push on and we're starting to, to, to um, invest in in a lot of different ways is the ability to do uh, uh, faster, smaller footprint manufacturing closer to the point of care um, as it was pointed out earlier, in in you know in in, in places where uh, um, you know outbreaks might be occurring, and other in places around the world in low resource settings, you know I think having more integrated on demand manufacturing, continuous manufacturing, there's a lot going on in this space, um, both for nucleic acids and even you know generic drugs and things like that. Um, so that's that's really important as sort of one piece of it. The other is that there's a lot happening in terms of synthetic biology. Um, and, and having entirely new platforms to produce proteins and antibody-based therapies um, that are gonna significantly lower costs uh, over time, I think, and, and at least that's the hope, right? So that you know, these could be more accessible, more easily available, um, and, and you know, be more useful in a rapid response mm -hmm. scenario. Great, thank you so much. Well, um, Sanjeet, this has been a great conversation highlighting really important areas for future pandemic preparedness. Um, uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more, the annual report is released now, and it really does a great job in laying out um, in, in great detail many of the innovations um, that you heard Sandeep talk about today um, and things that will help support future pandemic preparedness in our country, but also across the world, as we heard from our other panel. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Sandeep, and over to you, Matt. Fantastic. Um, again, uh, a pleasure to listen to. <laughs> I could listen all day. Wish it was a podcast. I'd be listening, you know, the whole 10 part series and all of that. Um, uh, th this was really uh, appreciate the comments. I, I, I would kind of maybe highlight one thing that that uh, a theme that flowed throughout each question uh, with both our panelists. And that was this idea of pandemic preparedness isn't this narrow response to a specific respiratory virus, and then uh, everything else is is a global health problem or an infectious disease problem or put in another bucket. I think what was clear to you, and I, I think the annual progress report emphasizes this, um, is that we should, the things that we're doing to combat global health problems um, can easily be pivoted to pandemic preparedness. And even more so, the better that we are at global health and at global health responses, the better prepared we will be for that next pandemic. Um, Rachel gave a really good example with hepatitis C virus and, and the, the, the exciting promise of potentially truly eliminating that disease. And as we do that, uh, we will be better prepared for scenarios where we need to rapidly identify someone who's infected and treat them. 
Um, there are a lot of other really good examples that we highlighted it in the report. We, we mentioned seasonal influenza um, as an example. We also highlighted uh, antimicrobial resistance, that, that threat that we all know about, that threat that we all uh, were very worried about. Um, but also, I think antimicrobial resistance, as an example, allows us to learn and exercise so much. As, as we diminish that threat, we will be better prepared for future pandemics. So super excited about the third panel. Uh, I kind of don't want this whole thing to end, but <laughs> we will. Uh, we do have to do, uh, let's, let's go, let's dive right into our third panel. Um, and this is on innovation for the future of pandemic preparedness. Uh, what I'm really excited about is th this idea that when we have the, the worst of our, of our complex problems and challenges uh, as a global society, um, that those require solutions from all different professions and viewpoints and perspectives um, in the solution to that problem. Um, and, and really thrilled uh, with Dr. Hebler and Dr. Reynolds um, because they, they represent that. They represent broad thinkers who have a diversity uh, of experience um, and they're just so good at solving problems. So uh, I, this third panel is gonna be great. Um, let me start. Dr. Andrew Hebler uh, serves as a principal Assistant Director for Health and Life Sciences and focuses on a range of issues, including COVID, pandemic preparedness, antibiotic resistance, and life science dual-use research. Most recently, he was the Senior Director and Lead Scientist for Global Biologic Policy and Programs with the Washington, D.C.-based non-governmental organization, the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, on a personal note, uh, I've had a chance to work uh, with Dr. Hebler since I arrived here in October. Uh, he is the consummate professional, uh, always mission focused, and it is it, one of truly my favorite people um, that I've worked with um, in my time in government service. Um, I also want to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Reynolds. Uh, can I, I'll, I'll just, we'll just call her Dr. Liz Reynolds because she goes by Liz and uh, um, certainly uh, is uh, another great colleague we have over here. A special assistant to the president for manufacturing and economic development for the National Economic Council. In this role, she focuses on the administration's domestic policy agenda for manufacturing and industrial strategy, supply chain resilience and regional economic development. She it was formerly the executive director of the MIT Industrial Performance Sector and the MIT Task Force on the Work of the Future, as well as a lecturer in MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, and it turns out that she's also done great work in the biotechnology ecosystem a long way back. So uh, my first couple of days on the job here, um, I heard about this extraordinarily brilliant uh, economic advice, senior economic advisor to the president. Um, but she had a little bit of interest in biotech as she looks at that massively broad portfolio. So what I've tried to do is monopolize every single second of her time for this purpose um, uh, while she's been here and has just contributed extraordinarily um, to the AP3 annual progress report. And you're also going to get a chance to hear how, how her vision um, on the broader domestic economic policy um, that for which uh, we fit in so nicely. Dr. Hebler. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, and uh, a big thanks to also Liz uh, for being here today to, to speak to us. It's uh, just been a really, really exciting last hour and a half or so, just filled with enthusiasm and just really not only excited about the progress, but the potential for us to make progress in the, the coming uh, months and years. Um, I wanted to just start by uh, noting just my own personal uh, uh, enthusiasm for being here today as someone who was part of the sort of original uh, team that put together and put out into the universe, the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, it's so exciting to take a moment today to look back on the progress we've made, but also look down the pike um, at the work we still have to do. It is also really inspiring just to, to remember the basic ideas that Amer the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan was really centered around. Um, the recognition that we have the scientific capabilities to essentially take epidemics and pandemics off the table uh, as threats to the United States and to the world. 
Um, and it was really centered around this idea that um, we could, we had that within our reach was the capabilities to within 100 days of the emergence of a pandemic threat, develop safe and effective uh, countermeasures to treat it. And ideally, aspirationally within 200 days um, to develop those products at global scale. And we're gonna focus a lot on sort of the manufacturing and the manufacturing innovation aspect of that um, in this uh, third uh, session. Um, we know though, to achieve those goals, it's gonna really require um, strong investments in not just basic science to plug the gaps in our knowledge on how pathogens spread and how they cause harm, but also really leaning into and accelerating the manufacturing innovation uh, our supply, uh, our, enabling our supply chains to produce products on U.S. and global scale within days and weeks um, and not years. Uh, and so with that, maybe I'll turn to Liz to offer a few just general reflections here at the top, and maybe then we'll turn our attention to a few um, uh, areas of discussion. Liz, over to you. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for having me. It's a very exciting meeting, and Matt, you're... Um, you know, kind words are, are totally over the top. I am well aware that I am the probably the only non-health expert uh, on this panel or perhaps in the entire webinar. So uh, forgive me all. Uh, I do have um, some experience uh, with biomanufacturing. In part, when I was a, a graduate student, I was focused on and interested in how we develop manufacturing where the U.S. could compete uh, globally. And uh, and as uh, as this report and other things show, there are just tremendous ways in which the U.S. Can, is a leader and can be um, particularly leader, not just in the innovation, but also in the manufacturing. And so uh, that is uh, my connection to this topic. But more broadly, as Matt was saying, uh, I've been working since day one uh, of joining the administration on supply chains and on all the supply chains we were not prepared for uh, in terms of disruption uh, based on the pandemic. Uh, and as, as everyone knows, the pandemic exposed um, enormous uh, national and economic security issues for the country, from PPE to semiconductors to transportation. Um, and it, I think it's the revelation about how vulnerable the country has been in, in a whole range of areas uh, that is motivating um, not only the response we see from, from um, on the AP3 report, but really across a whole broad spectrum of industries and importantly um, by the administration. And I, and I think it's important to highlight and hopefully people are, are a well, uh, well aware of, of this really what I think is an inflection point in our approach to uh, supply chain resilience, our approach to broadly to industrial strategy. Uh, if you think about the disruptions that were caused by the supply chain uh, by pandemic, that's one layer of, um, of challenge. Obviously the next layer uh, that we've had most recently on Russia, Ukraine is the geopolitical dynamics. Uh, we've got uh, the Russia, Ukraine conflict, uh, China, Taiwan, um, concentrated dependencies uh, where for critical inputs to our supply chains that we're now much more sensitive to, and, and a broader, I think, uh, agenda there around democratic versus autocratic governments. Of course, climate change, uh, another critical piece to this, to this agenda uh, and where we need to be building supply chain resiliency. Uh, and then finally, I think as part of the broader agenda for the administration is an equity uh, agenda where we have seen a growing inequality in the country, um, part of it based on the hollowing out of our manufacturing industrial base. Um, and that also uh, threatens the social fabric of the country. And so for all of these reasons, we see a real investment in a whole new approach to, um, to industrial strategy, one that is um, very much uh, a hallmark of uh, American uh, American industrial policy from since the beginning of Hamilton, and so I think what we've seen from the from uh, the administration is not only laying out the why of that, but now more recently uh, with bipartisan support the how of that. So uh, this agenda, um, you know, fits uh, squarely in in this broader vision for where the U.S. should be. Uh, developing in terms of domestic capabilities, but also um, in line with its allies and partners. 
That's great. Thank, thank you so much, Liz. And obviously, uh, well, maybe I'll just note at the top, uh, you shouldn't feel different being not a non-health expert. One of the really important things in this field is that it requires expertise across sectors. It's a really complex set of problems, and it's um, not just different disciplines. It's also collaboration across government, across industry, and across um, non-governmental organizations, both here in the United States and around the world. So just thank you for being here, and thank you con for contributing to this important effort. Um, you've talked a little bit already about the domestic um, sort of industrial policy and, and the administration's approach to the manufacturing agenda um, and have been really over the last year driving many of the changes the administration has taken to accelerate uh, what has been a really historic recovery in American manufacturing and industrial strength. And obviously this agenda is helping to revitalize domestic manufacturing and create good paying American jobs and strengthening American supply chains and really ex truly accelerating industries of the future. But I'm wondering if you could just um, offer your thoughts on how the kind of manufacturing innovation we think in, of in this sector just fits within the administration's agenda to bolster domestic manufacturing and supply chain resi resiliency. Um, well, it's, you know, what's of course the, the case with, um, with manufacturing, the manufacturing sector is that there's foundational technologies, foundational capabilities that support every sector in which we are actually making something. So when we think about what where the priorities have been for the administration um, and and what steps have been taken, it, in my mind, it's um, it's building a base that has the capabilities, build, be rebuilding our innovation capabilities, um, both from an from sort of the early stage R and D to the later stage manufacturing, and so first and foremost has been a recognition that our supply chains are not in a position uh, of strength right now in critical areas. So if people are familiar with the uh, with the administration's uh, reports that came out just about a year ago, the uh, 100 day reports, which focused on particular areas of vulnerability, which included critical minerals, advanced batteries, semiconductors, and pharmaceutical APIs. Uh, and then uh, in, in February, we released a broader set of uh, analyses across uh, seven different uh, agencies that were focusing on a broader group of, of areas, including uh, food security and USDA work, uh, Department of Transportation, um, ICT, and, and it turns out um, that, you know, we've got vulnerabilities across, across the board, and it also turns out that supply chain uh, vulnerabilities uh, have always been there, um, but now we're in a world in which they're going to increase at a very, uh, you know, accelerated pace. Uh, and I think it's McKinsey that uh, that estimated that any company in working multi uh, in a multinational capacity is likely to experience a major disruption every 3.7 years, uh, based on what we're seeing in terms of climate and other other aspects. So this is really a new way to a new lens to look at our manufacturing capability globally. Uh, in countries across the, you know, every country now is looking at, it needs to look through this lens. Uh, and um, if, you know, the U.S. with all its resources turns out to have tremendous vulnerability, what does this mean uh, for other countries, low and middle income countries? So that work, I think, has highlighted and we've done some very specific uh, work to build out and find ways to uh, reduce our dependencies in areas that are going to matter uh, significantly. Uh, to um, the biomedical space and, and, and medical countermeasure space. So uh, whether it's critical minerals, um, whether it's semiconductors, et cetera. We've also brought in um, the use of procurement tools and understanding that the federal government spends a good 600 billion a year uh, on, um, on goods and services. And so how can we use that as a tool to encourage investment here? Uh, we've brought in tax policy. Uh, people are aware of um, you know, our efforts to create the global minimum tax and uh, and how that has been used uh, around the world uh, as a way to, um, I think, undercut uh, corporate um, investments or in corporate uh, tax paying, you know, responsibilities. And so that's another area that I think, again, also touches touches this, this sector. Um, and I think then if we look at a lot of the uh, recent legislation, um, which I which I can get into in more detail if if needed. I mean, what we're seeing is that that the tools that we have at our disposal 
uh, are, are really working. So what are the tools that we have at our disposal? We often are providing uh, loans and grants. We have kind of supply push tools. We have also demand pull tools. So you know, tax credits and things that signal to the market that we're interested in and we need to rebuild our capabilities in certain areas. And we have already seen um, investments, about 100 billion commitments made in electric vehicles and uh, electric batteries. We've seen about an $80 billion commitment uh, from the private sector on semiconductors. Uh, we're seeing a whole host of ways in which uh, industry is responding. This is not just a um, you know, a government play. It's a really a much broader collaboration uh, going forward. And all of those tools, again, critical for rebuilding our capabilities here, but our ability to also uh, innovate in the biomedical space. That's awesome. Um, you mentioned we're at this inflection point, uh, partly as a recognition of a problem, but also because of this just diverse array of tools we and creative approaches we're taking to address it. Um, part of the opportunity at this inflection point is also just the alignment with um, uh, legislative uh, uh, victories and legislative vehicles that have provided new opportunities to make really important progress towards some of these goals. So um, over the last several months, obviously, the president has signed the bipartisan innovation law and uh, more recently the Chips and Science Act. And I'm wondering if you could just for your, your perspective on some of the synergies or opportunities you see with these uh, recent legislative victories and making progress, um, not just towards pandemic preparedness manufacturing innovation goals, but uh, in support of the broader domestic manufacturing ad agenda. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm glad I'm getting this question today and not three months ago, because I have a lot more to say. <laughs> um, but it it has been an extraordinary, it is an extraordinary moment. And I think what it... Um, what it indicates is that we can find a path forward um, in a way that's a you you know that's I think uniquely American in terms of setting missions, setting sort of mission driven goals for things that we uh, we believe are important for the country, but doing it with the tools and uh, with a very market driven approach. Um, and so the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, which you know many people believe is and rightly so, that it's about roads and bridges and ports and rail, but it also had an enormous amount of investment in our clean energy um, base. It's about, and other, in telecoms, it's about broadband, it's about EV charging, it's about batteries, it's about DOE demonstration projects. All of these things uh, uh, are, are part of a broader manufacturing and they're all you know manufacturing related. So how can we build that capability? Um, in that space. And then, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which, you know, combined with the bipartisan infrastructure law is around uh, the largest investment in climate in the U.S. history. It's about four times larger than anything we've invested in prior. Uh, prior. And we've got enormous goals that will really help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent. Um, and then finally, uh, the Chips and Science Act, uh, I think critically important for this agenda in particular in that, um, you know, it's got a, the, the microelectronics uh, basis for every industry, uh, including this, absolutely essential. You know, a third of our inflation last year was driven by the auto industry and the lack of sh the shortage of global chip uh, semiconductor chips. That's not, a, that's not a condition that we can all live with as a, as a country going forward. We absolutely need to address that, and the CHIPS Act does that. And importantly, the science part of the, of the CHIPS and Science Act, uh, you know, emphasizing the uh, importance and the R&D investments in, uh, in many technologies, including advanced manufacturing, uh, including, in, including biotech. And that really is pulling us toward not just the R&D, but also toward the applied and translational research, as well as building out our manufacturing ecosystem in ways that are going to benefit um, benefit in terms of pandemic preparedness as well. So I think, um, you know, I think it, the those three combined are just extraordinary wind at our backs. It, it really is a moment for us to be um, building capabilities. And it's not just, I will say, it's not, um, you know, I think we need to set the missions. We need to be accountable and transparent. Uh, we need to figure out new ways and, and better ways to collaborate with the public and private um, sector. We have to rebuild our capabilities internally, uh, you know, in terms of how we do things uh, within the federal government, understanding analytic capabilities, you know, permitting and act, you know, helping facilitate uh, the permitting process and all of this. 
Um, and then we have to coordinate with our partners and allies because we absolutely are going to be, we need to invest in our capabilities here, but we absolutely aren't going to be rebuilding uh, everything in the U.S. We shouldn't be. We need to be more strategic. We need to um, uh, really coordinate with um, allies and, and uh, in terms of uh, in terms of regional developments uh, around the world. And so I think those are all parts of, a, of uh, not only a, a plan and a strategy, but now we have actually resources to do it. And so that's, it's it's truly an exciting time. I think we'll look back in a decade and see this as a, a pivotal moment um, for the US and for our, uh, also our global relationships. Yeah, it's very unique to have this alignment of sort of challenge and uh, uh, tools and resources. And while we take this moment to reflect on just the progress we've made over the last year toward American Pandemic Preparedness Plan goals, it's also just exciting to think about the progress we're going to be making in the coming months and years as a result of this really rare uh, alignment. Um, I want to take a moment just to um, acknowledge uh, the the ways the advanced manufacturing uh, sector really uh, stood up uh, in the COVID during the COVID nineteen pandemic to really address some of the major shortages that we uh, experienced uh, with medical supplies and with uh, in particular personal protective equipment. And I know it's our hope that the advanced manufacturing sector continues to play this really important role in the U.S. response to future pandemics. But I'm wondering um, what role you see for advanced manufacturing and contributing uh, to future pandemic preparedness. Uh, well, Andrew, I couldn't agree with you more that I think that the pandemic actually um, exposed vulnerability, but also exposed tremendous strengths. I, I had the privilege of sitting on the Massachusetts emergency response team uh, that focused specifically on how the state's manufacturing base could help pivot and, uh, and manufacture uh, for uh, PPE and other other uh, uh, other aspects of the of the crisis, um, and I think what came out of that experience, from my to, to my mind, was essentially agility. That we actually have uh, tremendously agile uh, manufacturing companies here. Um, that given the opportunity and and given the incentives, uh, really can be there to respond in the moment of crisis, but can also be there to help us. You know, build what we need to be building now for more for for our national and economic security reasons. Uh, what's exciting, I think, about the moment here is that we actually are trying to address some of the challenges we have as a country in manufacturing and have you know bringing new tools to to do that. So when I think about the challenges we have, and th this came up in the last um, in the last panel, and Sandeep was talking a lot about what. You know, um, BARDA is doing to help address our manufacturing scale-up challenges. We have a tremendous startup ecosystem. We have not had such a strong scale-up ecosystem. Uh, and we've seen this certainly in uh, climate and other areas, but where we invent it here and make it elsewhere. Uh, new technologies are actually going to help us uh, turn that around. Uh, if you think about the foundations of modern uh, manufacturing, it, AI, robotics, um, additive manufacturing. These are ways in which we actually, we can compete in manufacturing with PPE and other, other areas globally, um, but we can accelerate. I mean, this is the important part. We have to be able to accelerate just as we're, we all the goals that we have uh, for pandemic preparedness is our ability to accelerate uh, our ability to, to uh, manufacture and scale. Uh, so I think uh, when I think, look across the landscape as to how we address that scale up, you know, there are financing tools that we're trying to bring to the table. If people are familiar with the Exim Bank, uh, we just had, um, in, Exim just introduced a domestic manufacturing uh, program that will invest in domestic manufacturers uh, as long as they are either currently or in the future uh, will be exporting 25% of, uh, of their products. A very interesting, uh, exciting tool. Um, we know that one of the weaknesses we have is that our um, small and medium-sized firms aren't adopting technology quick enough. We created a program called Additive Manufacturing Forward, AM Forward, where large companies are making demand-side commitments to smaller companies uh, because that's what they need. They need the demand guarantee uh, that if they invest in a ad additive new technologies, they'll provide, uh, they will be providing the demand to help pull those companies through on a, on a trajectory that helps 
reduce lead times, reduce vulnerabilities in supply chain, and also creates you know, greater sustainability. And then I think most importantly for this agenda here is the Manufacturing USA Innovation Institutes. If people aren't familiar with that network, 16 um, institutes set up st starting uh, 10 years ago uh, in particular areas that we understand to be critical for uh, the country's advanced manufacturing capabilities. And, and boy, are they off and running. This is an incredible moment for these for these uh, institutes that that span, you know, that span a whole host of technologies and and um, uh, and areas from com composites to robotics to ad uh, additive manufacturing to um, regenerative medicine, etc. I think that those institutes are, you know, they are collaborative. They bring in partners from all, as you mentioned earlier, Andrew, the way we're going to do this is, is through our, our various partners. And they've already engaged in air and um, in sort of um, addressing areas where they can help uh, with pandemic preparedness. I know the ARM, Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing, has engaged in developing robotics that could help with uh, competitive uh, PPE production, whether it's masks or with gloves. Um, I know that Nimble, which is the National Institute for Innovation and Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals in Maryland, um, has a vaccine analytics and assays center of excellence, and they are also developing like test beds. They call it analytic test beds. I, I like to think of that as kind of our pilot demonstration. You know, that's where we need to fill the gap in this country. Uh, so they're doing uh, great work have been funded by phil philanthropy in the private sector uh, and play a really critical role for us to get um, these these technologies, you know, from lab to market and in that critical middle stage of manufacturing readiness uh, levels. So, so I think those are an asset that we're investing in. Again, the Chips and Science Act is uh, elevates the institutes, and hopefully, people see them as a real um, resource going forward for building our our capacity. Now, the one other thing that uh, every single person, I'm sure, on this call and elsewhere will say is one of our challenges is workforce development. Uh, we have a shortage of workers. We had a shortage of manufacturing workers before the pandemic. We have an even greater shortage now. Uh, and so that's something, again, that's going to take a, uh, you know, federal state uh, efforts. It's re registered apprenticeships. It's um, investments in programs we know are working already. Um, and so that's another uh, priority for the administration and I think for, for this group as well. That's great, Liz. Well, we are uh, just over time, and I fear a digital hook is going to come and uh, yank us off the Zoom platform. But I would be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity just to highlight your perspective on the role of international. Obviously, we're talking about a lot of domestic goals, but it maybe just take a minute, and we would just love to hear um, the, the you affirm the importance, the uh, role that international partners, international collaboration um, bears on all these issues. Sure, Andrew, of course. I mean, I think that that's um, hopefully um, evident by the work of the administration since uh, day one. Um, and if we look at some of the work that's been done out of the G7 and G20 meetings uh, and the COVID summits and some of the reports that have come out, uh, clearly this is, you know, this is a priority for the administration. And as the this, you know, this webinar has been emphasizing, you know, now is the time for preparedness and preparedness is going to be different. It's going to look different than what we've been doing in the past. So we really need to collaborate at a global level to uh, reconfigure ourselves to be successful in this preparedness. And so I think that um, we've got a lot of conversations going on, uh, again, through those the G7, G20, but also a lot of bilateral conversations and other areas in which we've you know, we've got the Berlin Declaration just recently and a whole host of things that I think are going to be very important. And I hope that the work that we're doing in this country actually will have tremendous positive impacts and spillovers for our uh, our global goals as well. That's great. Well, thank you, Liz, so much. Uh, as others have noted, we could probably talk about just the to this topic all day, but um, we're going to kick it back to Matt. But what I will note before we turn it back to Matt is when you're the host of one of these webinars, you talk about everybody else, but no one talks about you. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge just Matt's leadership in this area and, and just um, his bold vision and his work over the last, well, since last October and taking the audacious ideas that were outlined in the American Pandemic Plan and really uh, working uh, uh, re in a focused fashion over the last year to make the really tremendous progress that the report outlines and just looking forward to 
uh, continuing to work alongside him and all of you uh, in, in working to achieve these uh, really uh, bold and important goals. And so with that, thanks, Liz, and uh, back over to you, Matt. So thank you again, Andrew, or kind of no thanks, a little embarrassing, but uh, so, but uh, uh, much appreciated. We, we should, again, huge thank you to the panelists. That was amazing. Um, I do, uh, I'm not going to do an Academy Awards laundry list. I want to say thank you. We have a small, small but mighty team here um, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy that have been working uh, really, really hard over the last year um, to make these things a reality. So um, I do want to start with uh, Dr. Carly Cox uh, and in particular today, who did all of the coordination and putting together um, so that uh, we could have a webinar. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Katie Brettel. Uh, she served with us as a fellow for a year. Her last day was yesterday. She worked until uh, uh, late, late, late evening and then hopped in a car and went to her next assignment, um, uh, but, but put her really heart and soul into making sure we had an annual report. I want to acknowledge Dr. Steph Guerra, uh, the Public Health Service Corps Lieutenant Anastasia Lambrew, uh, on detail from the CDC, uh, our communications expert, uh, Jared Adams, um, and that's our team who, uh, again, made, made all of this possible. Um, so what a great day. Uh, I, I have, uh, I, I think, I hope you share my uh, impression that we've really just scratched the surface in terms of all the things that we need to do um, for pandemic preparedness. I think today gave you a highlight of some of the areas where we are digging in. Um, if you do take a look at our report, uh, which is, again, we're super excited it's out today. Um, we've already gotten some comments back. And one of the comments is, wow, there's, there's a lot there. Wow, I didn't realize we have all these different programs and you're, you know, you're listing them. Um, and that's exactly the point, is that the pandemic preparedness is whole of government. Pandemic preparedness is whole of society. It's really all of us um, addressing it. And um, we, are, we are really proud and we, we are really hopeful of the different groups in, within our government who have been, you know, again, putting their heart and soul into making sure that pandemics never happen again. Um, so we don't intend for this to be the last uh, outreach event. Um, we're actually uh, planning to spend and to do a lot of public engagement um, over the next few months. And, and the reason for that is twofold. The, the first is uh, we really want to talk and talk about here's, here's what we're doing, here's what we're thinking, and really espouse that principle of transparency in our government, um, which is so important to all of us who you've heard from today. Um, but also, again, from Dr. Nelson and her leadership at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. If, if you follow what we do, um, in addition to equity, transparency in our government runs through all of that. So we want to tell you what we're doing, and we have a whole series of events that are planned for that, and we're play, we'll post it on the OSTP website. We'll tell you where, what, we're, what we're doing and where we're going. Um, uh, but we also want to listen. And we, we really see this endeavor. It's not, a, it's not an annual report and then we're done, but this is a living document. And um, our team's probably gonna celebrate for about seven or eight minutes. <laughs> and then we're already gonna be starting to map out what the next three to six months and what the report next year looks like and making sure that next year's report is even better. In that process, we're not in a bubble, we're just the opposite. We wanna hear from people. We, we're gonna go out. We're going to listen. Um, we're really excited. We have an upcoming trip to the great state of Washington, um, and we're going to be visiting biotechnology companies. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, antibody manufacturing so that we can meet that ambitious goal of the 100-day mission. Um, and we're also going to spend a lot of time with the state of Washington uh, Department of Health and all the great experts there um, and listen and learn from them and so that our pandemic preparedness efforts can be even better. So I wanna end with a, with a commitment from us and a request from you. The commitment from us is that we are gonna do everything we can as a government team um, to ensure that we learn from the current experience and that we are ready for the next pandemic. Uh, what we're not gonna do is we're not gonna stovepipe. Uh, we're not gonna say, oh, it's, it, it's not my responsibility, somebody else, no, somebody, we're, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna view kind of our, our effort as a government um, as a portfolio. 
start to finish. And we're going to integrate all the goodness across all these different departments and agencies, working domestically, working globally, working on the advanced development of products, working on the basic science, and, and, and we're going to put all those together. And it's for that purpose to catalyze innovation um, in our society so that we are better prepared. Um, we're going to listen to you and we're going to continue to improve. Uh, we're going to appreciate the criticism. We're going, I, I love living in a free society because we can express viewpoints, we can debate and we can deliberate. And I'll contend that ultimately we'll come to better solutions um, as part of that process. Um, so we are committed to doing better. Now, my request from you is, is two things. Um, the first is, is that, uh, that we take care of each other. I think that's one of the things that was what, what we noticed in terms of the best of us as a pandemic is that we took care of each other um, against this horrible situation and against this horrible virus. What I also am asking from you is, is that you, you partner with us and that you, you stay in the fight. You stay in the fight against COVID, against monkeypox, against influenza, against antimicrobial resistance, and against all of those future threats. And I think going into uh, Labor Day weekend, we certainly wish you a, a restful weekend. Labor Day, for, for us Americans, Labor Day is a, a celebration of, of the effort that we put in um, for the noble endeavor of making our society better. And it's meant to be a time of rest. But I also ask that uh, as we rest, but then as we continue to fight uh, against these viruses and these threats um, that infectious diseases pose, um, that, we, that we stay committed. And in your different walks of life, and we have such an incredible diversity of participation today, but in those different walks of life that you, you, you stay at, it. it's to our public servants who are, you know, I ask, I ask that you, you stay resilient and that oftentimes what you're doing is not appreciated. Uh, we, we appreciate you and I think all of our society appreciates you. Just you have to remember that and stay in the fight. For students, you, we got to learn. And we ask you, especially you and the younger generation, uh, learn from our mistakes and make sure that we will continue to improve and to do better and to never be and to be encouraged to have that crazy new idea that no one thinks is going to work. Um, but by your persistence, we'll actually transform um, how we are ready for the next pandemic. Um, I ask, and I would probably conclude in those that are, are really out there on the front lines that are uh, taking care of patients, that are the community health workers and the social workers um, that are uh, oftentimes feeling discouraged and feeling unappreciated. And I just ask that you have hope. Um, and I hope that we as a government are supporting you um, for those people that are truly out there doing, you know, fighting these pandemics on a daily basis. Uh, we're here to support you, but what we're also going to do is catalyze the entire uh, parts of our society um, so that you can truly improve the health of our population. I'm very appreciative that you participated today. We thank you for your time and uh, please read the report. Thanks everyone. <laughs>